Amen. 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 20. I've got two verses this morning and then, then we'll preach. It says this, then Elisha died, which was not ideal, but he did. And they buried him and the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. So it was as they were burying a man. This, this verse, this story escalates very quickly. So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. That went from a funeral to a war to a resurrection. And obviously after that, I'm sure after waking up in someone else's tomb, It's fair to say he possibly needed some therapy. (laughs) But this is a crazy miracle from God. We don't know his name, but this man dies. And at his funeral, a war breaks out. And they don't know what to do with him. I guess they want to preserve his dignity. So they say, what are we going to do with Bob? They go and put Bob in the tomb of Elisha. And I'm sure Elisha didn't mind. He wasn't there. He's in, in heaven. And so they put him in the tomb of Elisha. And the Bible says, as soon as the body of that dead man touched the bones of Elisha, he he revives, he wakes up, he stands up, and he's raised from the dead. He didn't have faith. He 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 had no idea. He was just put there. And he wakes up. It was a supernatural miracle from God. And, and, and it's, it's a pretty, you know that you have a pretty serious anointing on your life that long after you're dead, you're still moving in miracle power because there's power left over in your bones. I, I don't know about you, but I want to be so full of the Holy Spirit that there is fire in my bones. Uh, is, is it Jeremiah? He said, he, he, he's talking about a word that he had. He said, it's in me. He, he goes, I've got the word in me and he couldn't get it out. He said, it's, it's like a fire. Shut up in my bones. We used to sing about that back when I was a boy in church. We'd sing, it's, there's fire shut up in my bones. What, what, what does that mean to us today to have fire in our bones? It means that we have the Spirit of God at the very core of who we are. We carry something. It's not just, it's not just in our mind. It's not just in our words. But it's so a part of us, it's like you can feel it in your bones. I, I feel it in my bones, God. You're about to... You're about to do something. And this man had fire in his bones. He had such a, a, a touch of the fire of the Holy Spirit, Elisha, on his bones that a tomb became a temple, that a funeral became a revival. When there's fire in your bones, revival happens in unexpected places. When you, can I come down here too? Is that all right? I, I, I'm nervous about these stairs. I, I fell off a stage one time preaching. It was very embarrassing. You, you kind of lose a measure of authority after you've fallen off a stage. You get up and it's like, as I was saying, brothers and sisters. <laughs> my, my dad, I don't know what you'd talk about in pounds, but my dad's a, a big guy and he's getting, you know, 75 and he was preaching at a church and, and the stage would be like this high with stairs on the front, but he thought it also had stairs on the side. And so he, he stepped off. That was powerful. And uh, he's, he still has P, PTSD. He won't go back to that church. He's, no, I'm not going back. But anyway, that's off the, off the topic. So this man had fire in his bones. And as a result of having fire in his bones, a tomb became a place of breakthrough and miracles. An unexpected place became a place of revival. We often talk about revival in a church, but revival in a tomb is not something that you, you ever really expect. It's, it's like the, it's a place of mourning. It's a place of death. It's a place of dreams that have come to an end. It's a place of, of, of transition. It's a place of, it's really a place where there's no more hope. And, and so this tomb became a place where God performed 
a total miracle, not just a little miracle, I'm talking about a literal resurrection. And, and it tells me that if God can move in that tomb, he can move in any unlikely place in our life. If there's fire in our bones, God can move in unlikely places. He can move in calamity. He can move in sickness. He can move in poverty and lack. He can move when we're broken. He can move when things are impossible. We serve a God who can move in unlikely places. We saw him move in the lion's den. We saw him move in an upper room. We saw him move in Gideon wine press. We, we've seen him move all over scripture in unexpected places. When there's fire in our bones, God can turn up and do the impossible. You might have a family that are away from God. You might have chaos in your home. You might have so many things going on. Again, we've, we've got the fire of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Those impossible places can be places of miracle testimonies of the grace of God. Oh man, I... I feel that in my bones this morning. And I, I was preparing this message to preach at our church a few, a little while back for Pentecost Sunday. And I remember my dad is 75, is a healing evangelist. An evangelist is like a pastor that can't hold down a full-time job. So they got to preach in everyone else's church. And so my dad had this tent and, and, and we'd have like tent crusades. So we were like, we we're like the traveling circus, my family. And, and so we'd have, we'd have these tent meetings. And I mean, people came to the tent and my dad would have the revivals, we'd sing all the songs. And, but he used to preach this. He'd talk about Elisha's bones and he'd get up and I'll, I'll never forget it. He, he's still alive, by the way. So I'm just, yeah. So he, he'd, he'd get up and he'd go, I want to have the fire of God in my bones. You need the fire of God in your bones. That's how he'd preach. And I'd listen to to that. And so one night I I just ran out of sermons. I don't know about you, Pastor Jonathan, but I was out. I'd preach them all. I'd preach Noah's Ark, Samson, Moses, Abraham, (laughs) preach the tabernacle, the book of Revelation, preach the rapture, preach the resurrection. I preached baptism in the spirit. I I preached it all. And one Sunday I was just out of juice. I thought, what do I do? (laughs) So I thought, I know what I'm going to do. Elisha's bones. So I thought I'd still, see, my dad would have been so proud, he'd be so proud. He wanted me to be a pastor so much that for my sixth birthday, when all of my friends got like G.I. Joe or Lego or Stretch Armstrong or some kind of Tonka truck or whatever, not me, I got an overhead projector. Does anyone, does anyone remember what I'm talking about? Like, not, 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 not this fangle dangle technology. I'm talking about a box this big by this big by this big, has a stick with a lens and some glass and and you'd put the words on a transparency, and if you put it on upside down, they thought it was Mission Sunday because the lyrics were in Russian. And so I'd set up my overhead projector. I had one of those screens on three legs, and I'd line up the teddy bears. I'd lead them in singing, and it wasn't like new songs. This was back in the 80s. It was songs like, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Does anyone know that? I will say this is the day that the Lord has made sing. Everyone that's singing along, you've just revealed one thing. You've been in this a long time. <laughs> there is power, power, wonder, working power. We'd sing them all. And then I'd do the altar call, lay hands on my bears. I'd fall under the power, except one. He was Presbyterian. So he wasn't open to the things of the Spirit. So then, then this escalated a little bit. I started to invite my friends over. We'd play a bit of church, Pastor Jonathan. And we'd do communion, but I didn't have the elements, so I'd get cough syrup and cookies. <laughs> I'd hold up the cough syrup and I'd say, there's healing in this cup. <laughs> but then I discovered the real secret. Then I started receiving love offerings. <laughs> I was a full-time preacher at the age of six. <laughs> anyway, my dad, I don't know why I told you that. So, so my dad, would pre- he'd preach Elisha's bones, so I thought, I'm going to preach Elisha's bones. So I started studying this. And I realized there's so much in two passages, in two, two verses, there's so much. But there was one thing that I'd never noticed before that was actually a tragedy. So there's, there's so much triumph, but there, there's a tragedy. And so, and, and, but, but I believe it's such a challenge for the church. And I, I want to I get there, but, but I want to give you four things that happen when there's fire in your bones. And so three of them are awesome, but the fourth is a challenge. And and, and number one, when when there's fire in your bones, number one, you carry resurrection power. There's triumph. There's victory. Carry resurrection power. As soon as death came in contact with life, something had to give. As soon as the natural came in contact with the supernatural, something had to give. When death comes in contact with life, 
something has to give. See, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. That's why he came. He didn't come just to make you good. You, you were crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Man, when I, when I got saved, sure, I was young. I got saved at six. I don't have a great testimony. I, what did I do wrong at six? I coloured outside of the lines and I bit my sister. <laughs> and sometimes I fall back into my old ways and I... I, I no, no, I, I, she bites me. I used to complain about my testimony. I didn't think, think I had a good one. We do, in Australia, I don't know why it is, but we always love the American preachers that have like a great story. So if you were like a criminal, we want you to come and preach. Even if you're currently a criminal, we're still open. Uh, my testimony, I remember saying to God, my testimony is boring. He says, doesn't, he said, you're still going to the same devil's hell. You are still as lost and you're still found by the grace of God. You might, not have a, you might not have an exciting testimony. It doesn't matter how spectacular the story is. The bottom line is, if you're lost and now you're found, that's a testimony. And can I say this? If you've got a testimony, just do this. Make sure you keep your testimony. Oh, man. So it's a place of resurrection power. When there's fire in your bones, you carry resurrection power. When, when uh, Billy Graham died, they said to, this quote went around the internet and said, one day you'll read that Billy Graham has died. He said, don't believe a word of it. I'm more alive than I've ever been. I've simply changed a dress. I like that. One day, and it's going to be a long time, I'm going to, I'm going to leave this life. And I'm going to breathe my last on earth and then I'm going to breathe my next in heaven. I can't wait to get to heaven. Streets are paved with gold. The walls are of jasper. Jasper. (laughs) The gates are of pearl. The sea is crystal. I can't wait to get to heaven. Can't wait to see Jesus. I want to see Moses. I want to see David. I want to see Abraham. I want to have a couple of strong words with Adam and Eve. (laughs) A couple of things I want to get off my chest truth is if they hadn't eaten it one of us would have so they just got it over over and done with (laughs) carry resurrection power God isn't just a resurrecting God and he's not just one who's been resurrected he is the resurrection and the life and so you and I carry power to bring life to dead situations in the name of Jesus. Resurrection power lives on the inside of me. That resurrection power, that same power that went into the garden tomb 2,000 years ago is alive on the inside of you and me. That's amazing. Like I sit back and I think about that. I say, wow. And then I say it backwards. Wow. (laughs) Then I say it upside down. Mum. Anyway, that's just stupid. Second thing that happens, when you have fire in your bones, number two, you walk in the promises of God. You have a testimony that God does miracles and that he keeps his promises. Let me show you why you walk in the promises of God from this story. Elisha has died. He's in the grave. Now, his spiritual mentor was Elijah. Sometimes when I'm preaching and I tell a story and I can't remember which one's which, I just disguise it and go, Elijah. Because <laughs> sometimes you get it wrong. But Elijah, I mean, that guy was wild. He calls down fire on Mount Carmel. He, supernatural things. And, and he meets Elisha. And Elisha asks him, I want a double portion of your spirit. He says, you ask a hard thing. But Nevertheless, God did it. So he asks for a double portion of the anointing that was on him to come on his life. What a, what a great request from a young leader to an older leader. I don't, I don't want a double portion of your money. I don't want a double portion of your property. I don't want a double portion of your influence. I don't want a double portion of your earthly status. I want a double portion of the anointing that's on the inside of you. And, and so it happens. So look at this, Elijah performed 14 miracles under the anointing of God. You can read about them in, 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 throughout, throughout the, 
book of Kings and, 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 and you, see, you see the hand of God moving supernaturally in his life. So, so that happens. Now, it doesn't just stop there. Elisha takes on the mantle of Elijah when Elisha goes up in a chariot and, and uh, is taken to heaven. So Elisha, Elijah is taken up. Elisha, he carries a double portion of the anointing. In Scripture, it's amazing. The Bible's amazing. He performs 27 miracles in his earthly ministry. I'm not a mathematician, but 14 times 2, 28. I know. Like, to be able to work that out at such speed. (laughs) Sometimes I shock myself with my mathematical prowess. No, I've got a calculator on my phone, and I did that before the service. And so, so he, here's the thing. He performs 27, but double is 28. But, 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 but it's kind of double, and you could go, oh, it's close enough. It's good enough. Oh, yeah, you can round up. We all round up for Jesus. And uh, we'll round it up. But, but here's the thing. He's El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. He's not El Chipo, the God of nearly enough. He, he's Jehovah Jireh, our provider. If he says double... Man, I feel this in my bones this morning. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If if he says double, it's double. And so he only got to 27. Then he had the unfortunate uh, interruption of dying. But God had made a promise. And so there was still one more miracle in him. And so God goes, I'm going to have to put some anointing on those bones because I've made a promise. And so there's one more miracle. And so that dead guy, we don't know anything about him. All we know is he touched that anointing. And when he touched, oh man, I feel that in my butt. Wait, sorry about that. Yeah, I, know, I know I shouldn't do that. That's for a revival night. You're not allowed to run on Sunday morning. But when he touched the bones of Elisha, boom, something touched his body. And he stands up and he is revived. Man, if you and I as the church can touch the anointing, revival can come into our churches if we can touch the power of God. Oh, how, like the woman with the issue of blood, she walked up to Jesus, she touched him and what was on him touched her. If we walk into church with that posture and say, I'm walking in and I'm touching him today, he'll meet you at your point of faith. Some of us, we've settled for 27. The God's a God of 28. He's a, he's a plus one God. Man, I feel like preaching this morning. Here's a, come on, somebody, if you believe it. Some of you, there's an old song. I won't sing it because I, 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 I want to, but I don't fully know it. But it, it's don't give up on the brink of a miracle. Some of us, we're so close. Like as I'm preaching, I'm reminded that the church were praying for Peter while he was in prison. And they were at the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. And as they're praying... He has a miraculous escape from prison and is walking to their house. They don't know that. I just feel like maybe Miracle 28 is walking to your house right now and you don't even realise. Keep praying it in. It's going to knock on the door. When it knocks on the door, say, I've been expecting you. Come on in, Mr. Miracle, and bring breakthrough into my house. In the name of Jesus, if you're, if you're saved and you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you believe what I'm preaching, just for a minute, say hallelujah or do something. Somebody say, our God is an awesome God. So, 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 so we, we see the promises of God. Number three, when you carry fire in your bones, you carry the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and the anointing is transferable. Today, Pastor Jonathan's ministering here at the front and says, come forward if you, if you have a need or you need a breakthrough, you need a miracle. Hundreds of people come forward and I'm watching this happen. I'm seeing people. It wasn't spooky it wasn't weird. The Holy Ghost will not make you weird. If you meet people that are Holy Ghost people and you think they're weird, it's not the Holy Ghost that made them weird. They were weird before they had the Holy Ghost. So, <laughs> so don't blame the, the Holy Ghost as an evangelist. He leads people to Jesus. He gets them saved. He fills them up. 
And, and so here at the front, people are getting prayed for. I'm looking around, people getting touched by God, hands being laid on them. Why? Because the people praying carry an anointing. The people coming forward, you came forward in faith. And when faith and the anointing come in contact, there is a divine transfer that we call impartation. And so the anointing goes from one to another. So if it's in bones, it'll go from one to another. Some of you are sitting in a seat today, but the last service, someone was sitting in that seat and they got under the anointing of God. They wiggled a little bit and they, 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 there's a bit of anointing on that chair and you should just wiggle. You're, I'm trying to keep it age appropriate. Just wiggle it a little bit and, and let's believe God the next service is going to get under the anointing of God. What can God do? If he can get on handkerchiefs, he can get on aprons, he can get on David's sling, he can get on Moses' rod, he can get on a word you speak under the anointing of the Spirit of God. Oh, we carry an anointing when there's fire in our bones. My kids recognize it. I've got a son called James. He's the one with the teeth. We're working on that. It's expensive. Man, kids' teeth. I would try to get my wife, let's just pull them out and give them dentures. We weren't in agreement. My son gets stung by a jellyfish, Pastor Jonathan. Wraps around his leg. We're in Indonesia on a holiday. The one thing about Australian waters versus your Hawaiian waters, they're just as beautiful, but if you walk in them, there's a chance you'll die. There's the sharks, there's crocodiles. There's, we, just, we, just, we just keep... Let's just say if you go to the beach in Australia, your prayer life is pretty strong. <laughs> so he gets stung by a jellyfish, wraps around his legs. And some of you think, don't think jellyfish aren't nice. They're demon-possessed animals from the very pit of <laughs> eternal torment. And so, so he... He, walk, he goes in the water, gets stung, and it looks like he's crawled through barbed wire, barbed, barbed wire and, and it's on both legs. And so he's bleeding, he's crying. He's... So my wife Donna, she says, take him up to the room, get him in a warm shower now, so make sure he doesn't go into shock, get hot water on his legs. And so, so, but he, he's a little lump, my kid, and I'm not that strong. So between us, he had to walk. And I, I'm, because if, he, if I held him, it would have hurt his legs. So he's, he's screaming, we're walking through the... We're walking through the resort and he goes, Dad, pray. <laughs> so I'm holding his hand. I, I, so I'm, I, 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 as a Pentecostal, pastor and father, when your son yells out, pray, okay, you only had to ask. So I went, oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we approach thy throne of grace, beseeching you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you would come and touch. And he goes, no. He goes, in tongues. So I'm, oh, man. So, uh, fine. So I'm walking through this, and excuse me for one moment, but I'll give you a demonstration. I'm walking through the resort. My kid's legs are bleeding. <laughs> He's, ah. I'm like, I reckon if anyone had come in contact with me, they would have been slain in the spirit. I felt like Benny Hinn. In fact, I went and invested in a white suit just to celebrate the goodness of the lift your hands, I'm telling you. Three people get that joke. <laughs> but I, I can, and I give God praise. We only had to take one leg. Glory to God. That's it. <laughs> I'm kidding. We took both. So, no, he's got them both. That's what the anointing of God does. It stirs faith. I used to think, I'd go to altar calls as a teenager. I need the anointing so I can preach and be a pastor. Never dawned on me I needed to be a father. Running a church is easy. Doing this is a lot easier than trying to get your kid to eat peas. (laughs) I have more faith that people are going to get set free and delivered than I do for my kid to eat peas. On Monday night. <laughs> Here I'm God's man of faith and power. At home I feel like God's man of paste and flour. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I've got the... That's why you need an anointing. You need an anointing to be married. I thought that would be easy. I just went into it and thought, no, no, I'm going to write books. Three months in. It takes work. I need an anointing in my house. Signs and wonders. They point people to Jesus. All of those things of the Spirit, I thank God for them. But we, we, we become very religious when we limit it to the house of God and not our own house. I need signs and wonders. I need my kids to experience the supernatural. I, 
I want them to know that Jesus is alive and the Spirit of God within us is real. And I don't want them to experience cultural Pentecostalism. I want them baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. I've got, I've got to finish preaching. I've got one more point. Wait, is that number three? That, yeah, that's three. I might add one because I'm having a good time. Number four, when you have fire in your bones, and this is, the, this is my challenging point. When you have fire in your bones, you, you steward the anointing for the next generation. And the positive is that you have an anointing for the next generation. But the negative is, if you don't pass it on, it's actually a tragedy. See, I, I believe, and I'm not saying this as a, like, doctrinal, there, there's no wriggle room in this statement. I'm just saying it as a, a it, it's got a degree of flexibility, but when I look at scripture, it seems like the anointing doesn't leave the earth. Someone will go to heaven, but what's on them gets imparted to the next generation. Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, Moses to Joshua, Elijah to Elisha, Jesus, he, he, he left, but he didn't really leave us. Yeah. He sent the Holy Ghost. And so we're here today. Jesus is in heaven, but he's so real within us. We're, the Bible says we're witnesses. You receive power to be, you'll be, be a witness. So what, what, is it, what does that mean? I, I, I wasn't there when they hung him on the cross. And I wasn't there when he rose again from the dead. I didn't see it. But if I close my eyes, I've seen it. It's so real to me. It's like I was there. I didn't see him call Lazarus out of the grave, but when I close my eyes, I see it. I didn't see him feed 5,000 people with a boy's lunch, but when I close my eyes, I'm there. And that's what it means to be a witness. I'm a witness. I can give evidence, but I can give it by faith through the infilling of the Spirit and by the anointing of God. But, 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 that, but that, that anointing came on me that was on Jesus. It's on you. But the, presence, the, the power of God it seems to stay on earth. And God raises the next generation. Who's the next Billy Graham? Who's the next Reinhard Bonnke? Who, who's the next X, Y, Z? But Elisha, he had the double portion from Elijah. And he had an assistant with him by the name of Gehazi. Gehazi did business on his behalf. He'd give him his staff, which was like giving him the iPhone and Apple Pay. And he'd go and do business in town for Elisha. When Naaman, the great commander of the Syrian army, needed a healing from leprosy, they came to, he came to Elisha. Elisha didn't even answer the door. He sent Gehazi. Maybe if Brother Keyboard could come. And we've got to wrap this up. The two of you taking notes look weary. <laughs> so, 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 he, so he passes on Elisha, Elijah to Elisha. And Gehazi gives the instruction to Naaman. Elisha didn't even see him, Wouldn't, didn't even bother to talk to him. Gehazi gives the instruction on behalf of Elisha. The man gets healed, offers Elisha money. Elisha wouldn't take it. And Gehazi, the Bible says, ran after that money. Then he ends up with leprosy himself and he's no longer, he's no longer ready to step into what God has. So he had a spiritual father with, with an anointing for a son. And the son chased after the natural rather than the supernatural. That's why I would remind everyone here, if you're a son and daughter in God, chase after the things that are spiritual. My pastor, he died last year. And he was 87. His name's Andrew Evans. He's my hero. I spent so much time with him. I have no regrets because I spent so much time with him. I'd ask him questions. Why do you do this? How do you do that? And he'd say things to me like, well, I pray about it. I get a word from the Lord. And, and so now I find so often I've got to make a decision. I've got my little wristband that says WWAD. What would Andrew do? <laughs> but, I, but I feel like I've got something from him because I stayed close. And I didn't want what he had in the natural. I wanted what was in the spirit. You know, here in this church, mum and dad, we carry something. It's for our kids. You might not always like, you know, you might, you might go, I prefer pews. I prefer it a bit more old school. You walk in here, yeah, it's pretty fresh. It's pretty cool. And it's not a church that's trying too hard. It's a church that's trying to reach another generation of people. And 
You can go around my city and so many of the old, beautiful English-built churches are now restaurants or Airbnbs. And Why? Because they had something. They put it in the tomb of tradition, the tomb of religion. But we must take what we have. Like the psalmist said, when I'm old and grey, I want to make the power of God known to the next generation. We've got an anointing. I want it in my bones. But I want to make sure I pass the mantle to those that are to come. I'm finished. That's the end of my message. Let's stand. I'll pray. I'll hand back to the Reverend. Give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Hey, if this sermon blessed you and your family, I want to encourage you to be a truth partner. You can do that by simply going to creativechurch.com slash give and partnering with us to help get this message of truth out to more people in our nation and around the world. It is our truth partners that make this a reality. Again, thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thank you for liking today's video. We'll see you back here on the channel real soon.